Okay. <clears throat> Good morning. Welcome to this uh, summary lecture. I guess you are quite busy with uh, assignment work and preparations these days. Um, I'll just go s right to the to the point here and uh, just I'll try to give a a short summary of this course, which has been um, quite diversified in terms of, of topics that uh, has been included. Um, we started uh, with an introduction. <coughs> we then went on with uh, this seminar on essay writing, which, which hopefully have been, has been useful for you. Uh, <coughs> then we continued with uh, international trade as a premise for transport activities, which uh, which is an important point of departure for what we actually talk about when we deal with international transportation. Uh, we continued with uh, introduction to logistics and supply chain management. We had then an, a, a lecture on maritime transport, technology, structure and characteristics. Uh, then we continued with international logistics, including risk, supply chain risk. Uh, then back again to maritime transport, seaports and terminals. And then <coughs> environmental performance of freight transport. And then finally, land and air-based modes. Um, and then last week, this guest lecture on transport law and customs clearance in good terms. Um, <coughs> so this is kind of the main, the main contents. Um, This wasn't much. <laughs> Actually, I think I just need to uh, sort out some synchronization problems. I'll just go upstairs to my laptop.
should be in order. <coughs> okay, sorry about that. It happens from time to time. Last night, as perhaps some of you noticed, the whole system went went down here, so I was a bit anxious about how to to be able to show you this, but uh, but it sorted itself out. Uh, well. Uh, I will divide this into two parts. One is uh, part one is then the introduction and uh <coughs> and maritime transport, and then part two will be about the the other parts of the course. Um, we started with this uh, broad picture <coughs> about uh, explaining megatrends, key drivers behind international transportation. Uh, and this is uh, kind of important to have in mind when we discuss the, the, the underlying, uh, uh, let's say, characteristics of this international transport market. Globalization of consumption, <coughs> deregulation of transport systems, uh, Air transport, sea transport, road transport, even rail transport is increasingly deregulated. And uh, we have talked a bit about that and about whether deregulation really uh, can be expected to, to decrease prices, transport costs, or whether it could lead to market concentration. So it's a paradox <coughs> in deregulation uh, that in the short run, it can be good for the prices or transport costs. In the long run, it can be it can lead to market concentration and then uh, a cost increase. If the market is characterized by <coughs> large units and high fixed costs, because larger units and uh, economies of scale, big is beautiful will lead to concentration because it's uh, you, you lower the unit costs if you are able to merge into big units to, to run bigger ships and that may <coughs> then cause a limited number of big powerful players to be in the market and they have market power in, in many cases. <coughs> increased productivity goes a bit <coughs> along the, the same discussion. If competition works and if you get all these nice scale effects that I've talked so, so much about, then <coughs> we, we, we will get this change in productivity or increase in productivity passed on to the consumers. If the competition do not work, if it does not work, then the, the benefits of productivity may to a larger extent be uh, remain in the hands of the, of the transport companies and the terminal operators and, and so on. So this is a quite difficult question to answer in a, in a very clear way, whether deregulation has actually or how large that positive cost effect has, has been in, in practice. Goes also <coughs> with this one, structural changes in demand and supply, where there is, again, a tendency of, uh, of concentration. Uh, the players become more professional, which is a good thing. Uh, but uh, linked with uh, too strong market power, which, as I said, may be the case in some, some markets. It's, uh, it's not uh, without problems. This works <coughs> sort of the, the other way, that if you have, you have a substantial growth in the trade, growth in the volumes, and hence uh, the, the size of the market grows which is a good thing in terms of, uh, of having, having more, more players into this, uh, this market and hence to, 
to then ensure that uh, the necessary amount of competition takes place. Um, <coughs> globalization. We we talked about this uh, division of labor, that you have a distributed pattern of production, according to uh, or in <coughs> in line with uh, let's say comparative advantage of different countries. Manufacturing, where labor costs are are the cheapest. Uh, high tech, advanced production capital intensive production in areas where <coughs> you have a high higher education level and uh, and uh, and uh, lower interest rates favorable conditions for uh, for getting uh, capital for the for the investments in 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 high tech equipment and and the like uh, <coughs> a lot of foreign uh, direct investments are uh, the flow of foreign direct investments is uh, quite strong, where um, multinational companies are investing in in countries where it's favorable for them to be in terms of, let's say, labor costs, or access to high tech knowledge. Um, yeah. So there has been a, a change in the division of labor since the 1960s and, and up to now. And in the slight tendency that some of the, some of the manufacturing industry is, uh, is actually sourced back to, to Europe and to the United States from, uh, from let's say, uh, uh, Eastern Asia. But uh, this, this division of labor causes transport flows around the world with components and uh, and the like local sourcing <coughs> is not always the the rule of the game it's uh, more common to have uh, sourcing from all over the place and the place in this case is, is on the globe um, barriers to trade has been removed <coughs> which is um, an important uh, factor behind the increase in in this productivity. We don't spend that much time on customs regulations, trade barriers, uh, which we'll come back to when we when we deal with <coughs> with international trade a bit later on. Uh, this box <coughs> is one of the main main inventions for uh, for uh, having this possibility to transport cargo over longer distances by means of different transport modes so the containerization which was invented around 1960 is uh, is a, is a very important factor when it comes to uh, exploiting scale effects, having these big container ships with uni uh, unified load carriers, which allows for, for big volumes and uh <coughs> also improved handling possibilities, less damages and so on. A lot of good things with, uh, with containerization. Flexibility, also in terms of types of transport modes that are employed in, in the transport chain. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, also there are other aspects of this like uh, stock minimization and uh, information flows that has contributed to this, uh, this productivity increase. And now is the last opportunity to ask questions. I'll just remind you about that. So. If you have any, you, you should just interrupt me now at any time and ask for uh, for any clarifications. So this was the introduction, the introductory lecture. And you are, of course, allowed then to have all your 
your uh, belongings with you at the exam, uh, except for uh, electronic devices. You, have, you are allowed to have a calculator, but that's about it. But you can have a pile of papers on your desk if you like, uh, including the lecture notes. So uh, for details, you can, you can have a look into them as well. Um, <coughs> then I skip to lecture five, and I'll go back to, to lecture three afterwards, which deals with the international trade. <coughs> but maritime transport is, uh, is strongly focused in its course because it's important for, uh, for international transport. The main bulk or share of uh, flows <coughs> uh, worldwide are, are taken by um, by maritime transport. So <coughs> we have gone through these, these uh, aspects, technology, a bit on technology, market structure, uh, intermodal interface, which goes with the uh, port terminal um, part of this. Um, also a bit about market structure in, in the ports with cooperation among uh, the ports and, uh, and the operators. Uh, you need to, to know a bit about uh, ship types. These are the major uh, ship categories. <coughs> Different types of ships. Um, the main groups here and then you have the subset of liners, dry bulk carriers, divided into different uh, sizes. Um, some of them are named after specific uh, pieces of infrastructure like the Panama ch and Channel and the Suez Channel, where the ships are designed actually to use the capacity of that infrastructure to, to, its, uh, to its maximum. You see that uh, <coughs> you need to be in this area to, as a maximum to pass the, the Suez Canal, for, for instance, and a bit less for the, for the Panama Channel. And then you have specialized vessels here. And uh, <coughs> you have, I mean, you have all this information at hand at the exam. So I will not ask you about, please mention the main group of tankers. That will be too simple because then you can just look it up and, uh, and, and write it down without, without too much thinking. So, so that will not be, be, uh, be um, a question that I will ask you. Uh, but you should know where to find that information in case you need it for, uh, for, uh, for other purposes. That's a use in a sub-question or whatever. This is a very important characteristic of, of sea transport, <coughs> where you have this economies of scale, which I have drawn on the blackboard on a lot of occasions. This is uh, showing the economies of scale, cost per cargo ton, and the ship size, which has a, a strong diminishing pattern. The larger the ships, the lower the unit costs. This is why you get these extremely big container vessels for deep sea container shipping, for instance. So the, <coughs> the, the, the reason why we get these big, big carriers are uh, sort of more or less rooted in this, in this uh, illustration. And it has also some challenges con connected to itself, which we saw during the credit crunch in 2008-2009, uh, where, uh, as I said during a couple of lecture that lectures, that waiting, the waiting time to, to be filled to be able to utilize this capacity to, uh, to uh, at least a satisfactory extent. The waiting time became very long, so 
uh, supply chain disruptions resulted from this. It, it was an indirect effect of these scale effects that you got uh, supply chain disruption in uh, which which hit quite hard even in this region where uh, companies had to wait for their uh, supplies from, from, from China and elsewhere because the big ships they needed to be, be filled before they could could depart from their origin. Then <coughs> we have this uh, the overview of, of the vessels. I've not uh, spent very much time on this, but but the trends are uh, are quite clear. The ship sizes increases. Um, where uh, and you have also a a diversity in this market. It's not so that that you get only big ships, but uh, but you have, uh, for instance, in this bulk market, the maximum ship size increases. But you have also uh, focus on, on on smaller ships from for um, inland waterways and uh, and short short sea shipping along the coastline and so on. I, within the container market, you have uh, <coughs> you have also smaller container ships, which feeds into the big ports and, uh, and contributes to this uh, hub and spoke system of of bigger and smaller ships, uh, sort of playing together. You cannot <coughs> you cannot use an uh, eighteen thousand TU container ship in in the port of Oslo. For instance, that's not possible. So we need to use uh, Rotterdam and then uh, and then uh, split the cargo and use smaller ships to 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 the smaller ports. This is uh, <coughs> development in uh, in vessels, and we see that the container trade is uh, is uh, clearly clearly the winner in terms of, uh, of growth here. This is, the, this is capacity in millions of deadweight tons. Whereas uh, general cargo has, uh, has declined. And you have the other multipurpose is slightly increasing, but the container trade is clearly the, the winner. Trade patterns, <coughs> uh, they are of course a reflection of the division of labor around the, around the globe. We see the Trans-Pacific going from China to the US West Coast. We have this Asia-Europe from, from China to Europe, it's a very strong part of this. And then we have the Transatlantic from South America to Europe. And we also have some going trans-Pacific and then across the American continent and on to Europe via, via the North Atlantic uh, Ocean. But that is not a big, a big uh, stream in this, uh, in this uh, trade flows. Also some <coughs> sourcing areas for different types of transport was mentioned during during that lecture. Yeah. Again, some uh, <coughs> some facts. We see that the biggest share in terms of tons traded are crude oil. It's a very <coughs> exciting day today, at least for for some of us. Do you know what happens today? Yep. It's the OPEC meeting, which uh, <coughs> could result in, a, in, a, in an agreement to reduce uh, oil production uh, within OPEC and hence cause uh, the, the oil price to, to increase. But it's very <coughs> uncertain. It's a great uncertainty connected to whether they will succeed because OPEC has uh, 
I mean, you have heard about OPEC, haven't you? The organization of oil producing <coughs> countries, uh, where I think Norway is an associate member, not a full member. But uh, <coughs> they have had a history of uh, regulating production so that to, to keep the oil price uh, high. Uh, but, uh, and they were very strong player during the 70s, 80s, 90s. But recently, <coughs> there has been some, some developments which indicates a slightly reduced power from the, from the OPEC. Has to do with, uh, <coughs> with uh, new energy sources like shale gas in the, in the US and Canada, uh, oil sand production, which introduces new players to the market. So there is a kind of a, this is actually interesting, but I, I will not, it's, it's outside of the curriculum for you then. But if OPEC decides to cut production and increase prices, they will support the development of oil sand production, which is not a very uh, environmental friendly way of producing oil, shale gas production, and also exploitation of the e expensive oil fields in the North Sea, which are costly to, to develop. So if they cut production, they give an incentive for other players outside of the OPEC to increase capacity. <coughs> if they reduce, if, if they don't agree on any cut in production, they will of course lose money because then the oil price will probably drop <coughs> but uh, the good thing for them then is that uh, there will be a very weak incentive to, to exploit the very expensive ways of uh, producing oil and, and gas. So it will be, for f as seen from the OPEC perspective, uh, not a very clear positive solution no matter what they do. It's a kind of an interesting game. But you will not get that at the exam. Tanker market <coughs> trends. Uh, this is uh, this is a kind of an, uh, an exciting market for uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that, uh, as I said, the oil price is fluctuating, um <coughs> so it's uh, it's a very kind of difficult exercise to to forecast. Uh, the freight rates in this uh, in this business, and hence also the needs for need for capacity. Um, energy mix of regions is actually about to change a bit, because uh, and you get new sources of energy <coughs> uh, onto the market, which uh, which have slightly different different transport needs and also different origins. I mentioned the uh, shale gas, sand oil production. Um, <coughs> and you may also get new trade routes, which in the longer run may affect this, uh, this uh, business as well. Northern Sea Route, north of Rus Russia, which gives uh, two, two effects. One is a shorter route between Asia and, and Europe, which may also affect the the tanker market. And secondly, <coughs> the Northern Sea Route may give Russia easier access to the, to the global market for, for oil, particularly. Because Russia is one of the really, really big producers. So they, they may, uh <coughs> so actually the Northern Sea Route can be seen as a, a shorter way between Asia and Europe, but also as a, let's say, a new kind of uh, um, route which can open up the market in a, in a, in a way for, for uh, Russian oil. With obvious consequences for, uh, for oil prices. 
I was standing here, f f let's say, two, three years ago, and I was lecturing about peak oil and uh, and the high oil, oil high oil prices, which was at the time about one hundred dollar per barrel. But today it's uh, it's around seventy, and uh, I'm not quite sure what will happen in the future. It's very, very uncertain this energy market, and that also affects this tanker market in. Uh, to a very large ex extent. Um, <coughs> so the volatility of the shipping markets is much higher. It follows business cycles. I think you had uh, uh, a lecture on uh, on this uh, Baltic freight indexes, which can be uh, seen as a very good proxy of the development in in world business cycles. So this freight index is following the business cycles quite quite strongly. And this is the problem <coughs> which I mentioned with competition. That the bigger units within the container market can be an issue with respect to competition. And which will then be a counteracting force to the increased productivity in the in the global supply chains. So this is an this is a very important issue to deal with and uh, from the, from the uh, antitrust authorities uh, side. Market access, <coughs> as I said, deregulation has taken place. Um, within bulk, it's, it's a very competitive market, uh, spot market. The market concentration within bulk trade is not as strong as for uh, for uh, the container market, so it's uh, it's much, let's say, the economies of scale are present there as well, <coughs> but uh, the let's say per ton transported, the capacity is much cheaper. Ships are uh, are not that complex as we see f for a container ship. And the diversity of uh, of the fleet is also larger, so so that's why we see uh, a quite strong competition in this uh, this bulk bulk trade market. And in bulk, we talk about grain, ore, oil, gas, different liquids, chemicals, and so on. <coughs> With the liner trades, and then we include container transportations. There are very few bilateral restrictions left. And with that, um, I mean uh, liner conferences, where the ship owners were allowed to talk together and to set the freight rates accordingly, which is a kind of a cartel, which is in, in many countries uh, not allowed at all to, to cooperate, to regulate, or to, to, to gain market shares. But it was allowed <coughs> for many, many years in the liner trades because um, there was an issue with uh, to, to make sure that there was enough, ca enough capacity available. Because if this market went into a kind of a uh, what we can, what economists call a cutthroat competition, meaning that you can, with, with if a few players compete strongly against each other, <coughs> you will uh, sooner or later end up with uh, with bankruptcies, and that may, in the longer run, cause a very limited number which have a very strong power and can, can play with capacity and, and prices as more or less as, as they like. And that is also a, 
a phenomenon that is very hard to it's very hard to reverse it. It's more or less irreversible. Because if you have a very limited number of players left, you will not have any free entry into this market because it's very exen expensive to build up capacity and to to learn about the markets and to have all the all the things in place that that uh, is needed to operate within let's say a container market so we need to invest quite a lot to enter into this market so hence it's uh, it's no free entry and if you end up in a situation with let's say two or three big players you can you can get problems with the uh, with the prices and, and or the f the freight rates, <coughs> so there is some there are some uh, some reservations which I will not go go into. You have this. There are <coughs> the most severe regulations is within the waters of a country that we are connect that we connect to free competition and. Uh, and the private market and everything. Do you know what country I'm talking about? It's the United States of America. They are strongly regulating the, the, the sea transport and they also do it with air transport. I mean, if you have heard about <coughs> Norwegian trying to set up routes in the US, they have, they have severe problems with market access at the moment. Then we have all these, um, sorry, these conventions on environment. And why do we have these conventions in the first place? Uh, <coughs> Why do we need, because this is a kind of a regulation. This is what we call an administrative or formal regulation. Set standards. Double hull tankers regulates <coughs> discharge of, uh, of waste, regulates emissions to air. We have regulations because the market doesn't have the, the um, let's say, without regulations, the market doesn't have sufficient incentives to take care of this without any, any player forcing the market to, to move in certain directions. It's, uh, it can actually be shown formally that uh, a market consisting of different players, and there can be many of them, does not necessarily reach an equilibrium which is good for the society. So the sum of individual actions does not necessarily, it can do, but it's not ne it doesn't necessarily uh, give uh, an equilibrium which is, uh, which is good for for the society as a whole. So <coughs> to, to sort of amend such things and to sort of regulate important environmental issues, standards have been set. But within the administrative re regulations, you can have economic regulations. Like for instance, uh, charges for uh, emissions of, uh, to air of different substances. So when the EU decides that they should cut the emissions to air, CO2, with, uh, with 40% within, uh, within 2030, that is a kind of an administrative regulation to so set the target. But to, <coughs> to achieve that target, you can have economic regulations, quota trading schemes and so on, which makes the market adapt to these regulations by through, for instance, increased prices on, uh, on, uh, on fuel to be able to, 
to cope with or to fulfill the, the administrative regulations. So it's a market correction. way of, uh, of dealing with imperfections that can uh, be uh, harmful to the, um, let's say, to the global environment or the local environment or whatever. Safety conventions, <coughs> the same way, because, uh, because uh, I mean, you have an incentive to, to have the, the, the vessel running all the time. Uh, and perhaps to hope for the best without going into uh, safety issues as, uh, as uh, thorough as, as you should. And that is the same to try to amend such individual, let's say, behavior patterns, which uh, very often is about maximizing profits in a way but also to take the, the safety conventions into, into consideration. It goes with everything from construction to avoid oil spills and things like that, and also to, to, to take care of the, of the crew, the people on board, and to, to which is of course interlinked to the, to the objective to avoid accidents. <coughs> but also to regulate uh, the working conditions for the, for the people on board. Okay, um, I think I will, I will run through this maritime thing before we, uh, before we break. It takes a couple of minutes more. One example <coughs> of regulations is the sulfur contents of marine, fu marine fuel. For this uh, <coughs> this Seca area, which comprises <coughs> actually the North Sea up to the um, 62nd latitude, which is about here, a bit south of here, the content of sulfur should be reduced to say it's 0 0.1% in 2015. So it takes actually action from uh, from January next year. So it has been a stepwise reduction in percentage of uh, sulfur in fuel, which ends down to 0 0.1 in 2015. For the EU ports, <coughs> it has been down to that level since 2010, whereas uh, worldwide it takes a bit longer time, and it won't be reduced down to more than. 0.5 percent. That has that that is of course is an it's a um, consequence of technology uh, because uh, within within Seca and the EU ports <coughs> they are more or less uh, they can serve ships which more easily can convert to low sulfur low surf sulfur um, fuel like uh, ordinary diesel, whereas the bigger ships they use uh, heavy bunker fuel, which uh, which is still encumbered with uh, with more uh, or larger share of sulfur in the uh, in the mix or components in the fuel. So that's the reason why it's a different level here. So. Uh, <coughs> global re regulations necessary. Um, and that has to do with environment, safety, and also uh, collaboration to avoid cartels and so on. Um, there are <coughs> national and international agencies that uh, monitors whether the ship owners are, uh, are performing according to the regulations. And, uh, and there are strict regulations on their way when it comes to, to as I showed you, on the, on, on the air emission side of this. Then we break. <coughs>